President Uhuru Kenyatta has slammed the International Court of Justice. That's after it sided with Somalia in setting a maritime boundary dispute with Kenya. The new boundary drawn by the International Court of Justice mostly followed a line proposed by Somalia attributing to its several offshore oil blocks claimed by Kenya. We find out what is at stake now and why Nairobi as well as Mogadishu are passionate uh, about these waters. To help us unpack that, we're joined by Professor Diret Ladiche of International Constitutional Law at the University of Pretoria. Thank you very much, sir, for your time this afternoon. Perhaps for the benefit of a viewer who has not been following the story very closely, just some context uh, as to why this is important. Well, I mean, it's important because, uh, oh, uh, I should say, first of all, thank you for having me on the program. Um, it, it's important because, obviously, um, it pertains to, um, to sovereignty. So first and foremost, it pertains to sovereignty, and that's always very important. It's always very sensitive for states, uh, what states own, what territory they don't own, and so on. So that's the first thing. Uh, but secondly, and you alluded to this in your introduction, um, it's also important because in that area, in the quote-unquote disputed area, um, there, are, there have been some, um, um, some mineral resources um, that have been found. And in fact, um, um, so over the last couple of years, Kenya has awarded some concessions, and that's part of what, what really spurred sort of this dispute um, in that Somalia argued that by, by awarding uh, these concessions for... Um, mining in waters that Somalia believed belonged to it, um, that Kenya was in violation of international law rules. And so that's the context for the case. In essence, a fight for resources, uh, you would say. Given that Kenya has rejected this, just how enforceable then will this ruling be? Well, um, enforceability is always a difficult um, uh, question for International Court of Justice decision. This would not be um, the first time that a state disputes a ruling uh, of the International Court of Justice. Um, um, so the United States disputed a ruling uh, against it uh, in favor of Nicaragua in the 1980s. Uh, Iran has disputed a ruling uh, 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 against it in favor of the United States. Albania has disputed a ruling against it in favor of the United Kingdom. And so this happens. And very often when there is a, dis um, uh, a state disputes the ruling, uh, the chances of enforcement become very little because there isn't a police force to enforce. Here in South Africa, as we have learned, if you dispute a ruling, uh, there's a police that can come and pick you up and put you in jail. That's not the same situation um, um, in South Africa. In a sense, it was... Uh, it was foreseeable that um, if the uh, the ruling went against Kenya, that there would be a, a rejection of the ruling because, in fact, uh, at various stages in the process, Kenya made it clear that it didn't trust the process. Um, in fact, it didn't formally participate in the oral hearings. Instead, it decided to to let its ambassador uh, in the Hague come and give a speech for half an hour and basically left. Um, so it didn't participate, and that's normally a sign that um, the state will not accept a ruling that's contrary to its to its interest. Mm. Geopolitically, I'm curious what then this means. Is it of any consequence? Well, um, in your introduction, you mentioned, um, so your initial introduction, um, so you mentioned um, um, so the possibility of, of war. So there's always a possibility um, that, um, that uh, these kinds of dispute could escalate circumstances that um, could result in a breach of the peace, uh, um, um, a threat to international peace and security. But generally, um, it, it, it basically remains a standoff, a diplomatic standoff um, between states. This would certainly not be the only case in which there's a dispute about boundaries. I mean, we have one, um, so believe it or not, um, so with Namibia, um, you know, and we've had one for a long time. Um, so it is possible for, unfortunately, it is possible for these kinds of um, uh, uh, um, so these kind of impasses, if you like, to to remain, but there's also a, always a possibility for uh, more serious physical conflict and violence and the outbreak of hostilities um, because of that. I mean, given some of the other things that are happening in that region, that would obviously be very unfortunate. I mean, it would be unfortunate, uh, so just as a matter of course, but given the other issues that are happening in that region, that would be particularly um, uh, unfortunate if uh, there was an outbreak of hostilities.
Absolutely. There's too much uh, to lose. So hopefully it does not go in that direction. Professor Tladi, help us understand why is the issue being presided over by the International Court of Justice, which sits in The Hague? I mean, the basic reason, I guess, is that it has jurisdiction. Uh, it could have been presided over by any other court or tribunal that had jurisdiction. Um, in this particular instance, um, both states had um, accepted the automatic jurisdiction of the court. So in disputes between each other, uh, they had accepted um, um, that they would accept the jurisdiction of the court. Um, and so because of that, uh, Somalia then was able to simply uh, submit the matter um, and the court would have jurisdiction there. Uh, I, I mentioned that there were uh, a number of other instances in which there are boundary disputes, but there just simply isn't a tribunal or a forum to hear it because the states concerned haven't accepted the jurisdiction of the court, for example. Our own dispute with Namibia is one such uh, um, uh, an example. Um, I must confess, though, that, that there would be another possibility, right? So it didn't have to be the ICJ. It was possible um, for uh, this dispute to be handled under the, um, the rules of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which would uh, make it possible for the tribunal uh, to exercise jurisdiction, the Law of the Sea Tribunal to exercise jurisdiction, or one of the other tribunals that are provided for under the Law of the Sea Convention. But in this instance, Somalia um, uh, chose to uh, submit the matter to jurisdiction because in international law, um, states have a free choice whenever a tribunal has jurisdiction, a state has a free choice in making a determination about where to submit that um, um, to dispute. It's not like in domestic law where there are set rules. This particular dispute will go to that court. This particular dispute will go to that court. Uh, states have a lot more freedom and discretion as long as that uh, forum has, 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 has jurisdiction. South Africa's dispute with Namibia, which you've just brought to our attention, are you able to give us a little bit more information on where we sit with that? Yeah, uh, um, so it's about, it, it really is about who owns the Orange River, and uh, that particular dispute also then impacts on a maritime, so, so where the boundary is will determine where the maritime boundary is, or rather, where the land boundary is will determine where the, so the maritime boundary is. In terms of um, an agreement of um, 1890 between Germany and um, the United Kingdom at the time, the colonizers, um, the, um, the uh, boundary is on the northern bank of uh, the Orange River. The result of that is that if you go strictly according to that treaty, then the whole of the Orange River forms part of um, the territory of South Africa. Now, Namibia disputes this. It disputes this on a number of grounds. One, it disputes this on the basis of the interpretation of that, that, that treaty. Uh, it disputes it on the basis of subsequent practice. Um, and it disputes it on the basis of uh, negotiations that took place uh, just after 1994, in which uh, the government was contemplating, in fact, moving the boundary uh, to end. There were some, some documents that were signed there. So those are the main arguments. Uh, but the dispute has been going on, uh, you know, every couple of years, the two parties get together and they discuss possibilities and then everybody goes home and yeah. Uh. So no threat really, essentially. How do we then reimagine this entire issue? Uh, there have been conversations uh, about it, right, of border disputes uh, on the continent with that context yeah. of colonialization. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, part of the difficulty is, of course, there's a prince, there's an uh, there's an African Union principle uh, to respect uh, colonial boundaries, um, and the reason for that is you can imagine if um, you can imagine if um, boundaries could be dis so if colonial boundaries could be disputed on the strength of um, uh, the fact that they were improperly drawn by the colonial masters. Uh, the kinds of chaos um, that could result uh, from from um, uh, that kind of situation. So that's the the basis or the reason for for that particular rule. Um, by the way, that rule is not accepted by everyone. I mean, I have a couple of I have at least two doctoral students that are writing questioning that rule. So it's not a rule that's accepted by everyone, but it is a rule. Um, the AU. Um, uh, stands firmly by that rule, and so um, um, it's hard to imagine um, a scenario in which that rule changes. And it's been accepted by um, so the majority of the states.
Hmm. Interesting. Allow me to digress, please, and get your thoughts in closing up the conversation on Burkina Faso's uh, announcement of the trial into the assassination of Thomas uh, Sankara. Your thoughts on that and the legalities, uh, especially given that Blaise Compaore will not even participate in this trial? Well, the only thing I can say, I mean, I haven't really been following that, um, So, but the only thing I can say is that uh, so as a matter of, of, of law, of course, uh, trials in absentia and international law are frowned upon um, uh, at the very least. So one would expect that, um, that uh, before a trial in fact proceeds that there would be um, uh, his presence, that the trial would take place in his presence or else there would certainly be the question marks about um, uh, the validity of the trial. Thank you very much for your time and for indulging us uh, there. Professor Di Retladi uh, is the Chair of International Constitutional Law at the University of Pretoria. A great pleasure.